Now I'm going to unshare my screen. Uh, let me see. There. Hi, everyone. This is wonderful. I'm so happy to be here. Um, David, that was, where did you get that picture? You must have found it on the website or something. I don't remember sharing that one. <laughs> no, you I love didn't. that picture. I love that picture. I love it. I love it. Um, so thrilled to be here. And I'm very much like David when I say I wish we could be face to face, but I guess this is the next best option that we have. So I'm going to share my screen so that um, I can this with you. Start. Can you see it there? Yep, it looks great. Good. Awesome. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to start, and thank you, David, for that very nice introduction. That was very, very kind. Um, I'm going to start by just showing you where we are. So this is just a map of Maryland, um, and we are located, like David said, way in, in the most western part. And in fact, our school is the most western school in the state of Maryland. Um, and I like to say that because people tend to think that the, the state ends between like Frederick and Washington County. They call this Western Maryland. And I'm always like, eh, go another two hours and then you'll hit Western Maryland. <laughs> so um, if you take Garrett County and you, you uh, kind of pull that out, Crellin is located in the Southern part of Garrett County toward the end here. This is Deep Creek Lake, which is a big resort, um, a family resort that, that has, has a ski slope uh, near the lake there. And if we just kind of dive into Crellin just a little bit further, there's a nice aerial view of the, of the school uh, and the surrounding community. So you can see that we are very rural. Um, we are definitely the hub of the community. When something happens at the school, it uh, we draw many, many people in. We have our back to school night and folks show up who don't even have kids at the school. So there you go. Um, they just like to be a part of everything that goes on. I'm going to go even a little bit closer, um, and there you can see the, the top of the school. You don't see the, the farm in this picture, but I'll, I'll chat about that in a little bit. But I do want to draw your attention to this line of trees that are here, right here, um, because that becomes a very significant part of um, our story. When I first arrived at Crellin, this line of trees went um, all the way across the, um, the back the back of the school here went all the way across and this whole section here was sort of the forbidden land right so nobody ever went back there it wasn't part of the school property um, it was actually we learned later on um, belonged to the county and so that became the sort of the barrier between the school and the community what happened sort of on that side of it wasn't um, supposed to be any of our any of our concerns and so literally when we talk about taking the school walls down, um, we mean not just the, the physical sense in which we were um, doing so just to get our kids out into the community more, but we physically had to take down a barrier that seemed to be blocking us from the rest of the community. Um, I want to introduce you or show you a picture of my staff. They are like family. Um, we are, David said, we actually have 130 kids. And so there's just one of every classroom, K through five. We don't have a pre-K. Um, and that's because there's only six classrooms in the entire school. We have, and I'm sure many of you have a cafetorium where it serves as the cafeteria, it serves as the gym, the music room, the art room um, on different days. And so we're just, we're uh, one set of bathrooms. That's all we have. Um, and we're just very close knit. Um, but we do, because there are so few of us here, just I have one teacher in every grade um, and I do have two title one teachers now, so that's a blessing. Um, but because there are, there are so few of us, you really do develop a bond, right? So these are the people that you're spending the majority of your time with every day. And so they do become not just your colleagues, but like brothers and sisters to you. So here is a, and for some reason, I'm not able to go to the next slide here. I'm not sure why it's not letting me go. There we go. I'll go that way. Here's another picture. This is probably one of my favorite because it's so, if you think about when I look at their personalities, there they are. You have Susan and Megan and Brittany all calm and cool no matter what happens. And 
here I am with a look on my face when the hen's taking off and then these guys just in utter disbelief that it's happening. Um, so that picture just kind of uh, really tells their personalities too. And so, although you may see some different faces up there, um, we do have, once you come to Crellin, it seems like the only time you leave is if you retire. Um, and so we have had some retirements and so we've had a, a change in faces, um, but the one thing that, that stays the same is the level of commitment. Um, by the folks who, who actually come to Crellin to work. Um, we may be small and because we are small, it matters. It really matters who um, is invited in to, to join us. Um, there's a sort of an attitude that you have to have. There's a, an attitude of um, we really will do whatever it takes and we, we like to live outside the box. Um, and, but that mutual respect for the differences in each one of us has to be there um, regardless, because that's, that's sort of how we survive. Um, and because of all of these really great differences between us, you know, we look at what our strengths are. Um, and when I look at those, all of these different strengths, when we are sort of describing each other and, and who carries what role, as, as the administrator of the building, it takes a ton of pressure off of me. It takes this weight off of my shoulders when I realized that um, I didn't have to know everything and I didn't have to be the expert in everything. I just had to surround myself with folks who knew a lot more than I did and who were absolutely willing to share um, their talents and their interests um, with the rest of us. So although I am not, um, if I had to pick someone who uh, I thought was the best writing teacher, it wouldn't be me. Um, and if there's a professional development that, uh, that we're invited to go to, I can look at my staff and say, you know, who feels comfortable doing this? And so um, we, we all sort of take on our, our own special piece and then just share that with one another. So that's who we are and where we are. So let me tell you how this journey began. So back in the summer of 2003, going way back, um, we had a science camp for our kids in grades uh, one to five. I was a new principal. That was the end of, um, uh, I guess it would have been my second year. And uh, I didn't know as a new principal that we had these academic intervention funds, right? And so it comes June and they're like, did you spend any of those funds? And I was like, oh, no, I didn't, didn't do that. But we're going to have a science camp. We're going to have a camp. Um, and in this camp, we had a plan that we were going to sort of trick the kids into learning, right? We were going to, uh, we knew that the kids loved to be outside. Um, we knew that we had just come off of a Lewis and Clark PD that summer, the summer before. And we thought, we'll do that. We'll, we're going to make this um, uh, a way to get the kids here uh, because we didn't think they would come for, we called it summer tutoring. So we decided to call it a camp. Um, and we had great, great participation that year. Um, many things, this was the um, beginning of an, an entire adventure for us. So it was during that camp that if we go back to that row of trees that I talked about earlier, we ventured past those trees, right? So we went off the school campus and we went past those trees. And as we walked back there, we found, um, we found some very interesting, uh, interesting things. And there are many, many things that we could explore, many places we could explore, and a lot that we could talk about. One of the um, main questions that were asked as we ventured back there is kids found this water. Um, it was a little boy named Marshall, I'll never forget him. Um, and we were walking back there and he said, ugh, why is that water orange? And I was like, I don't know, good question. Because one of the things that David didn't tell you is that I did not grow up doing all the outdoorsy stuff. I did not have any kind of formal training in any of that. Um, we just knew our kids loved to be outside and that that's where we were gonna head. So I didn't have any idea. I didn't know why it would be orange. I didn't know what made it orange, none of that. Um, and we continued on our, our little walk back there and the kids saw this. And they asked, why is this black rock? What is it all over the ground? And I can remember us stopping and looking at them. And I said, you guys are asking really good questions. I don't have any idea what, 
the answer is, and it's okay that we don't know, but it isn't okay not to find out, right? So if, if these are questions that are important to you, these are questions that we're gonna, we're gonna be asking. And that's what started um, us really focusing on what kids were wondering about, right? And so in the classrooms, you can find a big piece of chart paper where kids are what, ask a question that's something that they're wondering about and we'll put it up. Um, now, uh, in the older grades, they have their I Wonder notebooks that they keep. And they ask these questions because we realized at that point very early on that what the kids were wondering about and what they were inquiring about um, needed to be the platform that we were jumping off on as we were going to explore. So as I um, kind of just told you that, that I did not grow up learning about the outdoors um, and I did not grow up um, running through fields or playing in a farm, um, we brought in some help, right? So one of the things that we had learned early on was that Again, we don't have to know everything. We just have to know other people who can help us. And so we brought in um, uh, some different agencies, um, started asking lots of questions, started making phone calls um, and bringing in experts who could help us figure out what was going on with this property behind the school. Um, one question seems to always lead to another, which meant that we were bringing in more people to interact with us um, and to interact with the kids. Um, and as the children were learning more, again, those questions just kept coming. And so we just sort of were rolling with it, not really sure where this was gonna end up. What we did find out was that that property behind the school was an old tipple site. And there was actually a train track that went through there. Um, and a tipple site is where they, when they brought the coal out of the mine, they would dump the coal into the train car back there. And then off it would go um, head to Baltimore. And so what happened was when the mine closed, that um, leftover, what they call, it's called gob, was just sort of spread out, which is why we found out that our school sits a little bit higher than the rest of the town is because it's sitting on that, that gob. And that that orange water flowing into the stream was actually acid mine drainage from that area. Um, and so there was also a, we found out that there was a sawmill here um, at that time too, which of course that was adding to some of it. So as we um, continued learning and as we, the kids found out that it was something called AMD. And so that, that question came up of, well, why would that be here? And that sort of led us in to um, an oral history project where we were really studying the history of Curlin, because what we were finding out was that these issues and these I wonders that the kids were having, that we had to look back in time in order to figure out what was happening then that impacted where the children were living now. And so the best people to tell us what was going on in the town um, back then were our residents, the residents of the town, the community members. Um, and here pictured here are um, two gentlemen who I'll be forever grateful for, Reverend Grant and Mr. Schaefer, who um, were very eager to come in and tell their story. And so as that began occurring and the children were heading home and talking about what they were finding out about the town, their own parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles were saying, well, hey, take this in. This is an old coal mining bucket I used to use. Or hey, shoot, take these photos in. And so more and more residents started coming to the school um, that, to share their own story. And that became pivotal because when, I, when we first got here, there was sort of this divide between home and school um, and by taking down those walls and, and asking the folks to come in, we really began bridging that gap. Not everyone who goes to school has a great experience, right? And so some of our parents did not remember school being this joyful, wonderful place to go to. Um, it was a, a place that they had, didn't have the best memories about, right? And so they were, did not always wanna come in. However, when we began saying, I need you, can you help me? Will you um, 
you know, I, I need your expertise. You're, you're, you're the one who knows this. Then that gave them a real tangible reason to want to come into the building um, and help us out. So the community members became our primary sources as we were diving into the history of Crullin um, and why these environmental problems that we saw behind the school um, were existing. So the first thing that we did um, before anything was we decided to clean it up because not only was there that gob in the AMD, it had been used as a trash dump for many, many years. And so um, and when they, when they kind of let it overgrow and no one was really taking care of it, care of it what happened was it goes from the, um, the, the coal mine, right? The, the owners of the mine to the county, the county took it over. And so it just became sort of this dump that people began using. Instead of going to the dump, um, they would just take their trash back there. And, and back there we found, um, we found a trailer that had been torn apart. We found bottles, we found all kinds of things. Um, and so we called folks together and we said, listen, we got it, I need your help. We need to clean this up. And so we started to have our Krellen cleanup day. And, you know, I always laugh and say, only in Krellen can I say, how are we ever gonna get this out? And a dad looks at me and says, let me run home and get my backhoe. I'm like, oh, of course you have a backhoe. <laughs> yes, bring that down here. We need that. Um, or I say, what are we going to do with all of this uh, garbage as we pull it out? And one of the dads said, I work for the sanitation department. Let me get us a dumpster. I'm like, that would be great if you can make that happen. Um, but so we just were able to gather people all together and we just spread the words through the kids that we're going to clean this place up. This, this is not a place that, that we want to be. Um, and so that became a... Um, you know, a, a thing that was happening all the time. And it, it, it's, it's something that still can continues to this day. Luckily, we don't need backhoes anymore to, to clean it up, but we're always going back there and, um, and making sure that it looks the way it needs to. Um, but that having those folks come in and working side by side with them and that sort of that sweating and pulling it all out and making it look better um, really kind of started to, to bring this renewal sense of, this is our responsibility and we need, we need to be taking care of this. So um, after we had cleaned it up, we kind of looked around. I was looking at the parents and the teachers and we're like, well, now what are we gonna do? Um, and if I'm kind of going back in time a little bit now and just letting, reminding you that not have been someone who any, had any kind of formal training or who um, you know, studied science in depth wasn't really sure what to do with those spots back there. Um, the stream is right there. Snowy Creek stream is, is right behind us. And so um, we knew that was a mess, but we weren't sure. So we, we brought the community together um, and we asked, what do you guys want? What do you want here? And a lot of the parents would kind of put their hand up and they said, you know, there was a time in this town when if, if you got in trouble, if you were doing something you shouldn't, and your, your, your neighbor told on you, you got it when you got home, right? And so the, the community was more cohesive. It was, it was pulled together a lot tighter. And they said, now we have you know, um, things happening back there that shouldn't be happening with teenagers. We have, you know, was, we just got done cleaning this big place up. Look at it, how are we gonna make it better? And so asking folks, what do you want it to be like? They were saying things like, there's no place to walk your kid in Carlin. You know, the sidewalk is sort of the same spot as the road is. And we said, okay, we need a place to walk our kids. And they said, you can't get into the stream. You can't even get in the stream. You have to jump down when you go into the stream because of the, the bank there. All right, we want, we want a place to be able to go fishing. Uh, what else do you guys want? Well, there's nothing to do in the winter time around here. Okay, we need something then to do around the winter here. And at the same time, those, we were looking at what does the community, what would the community want to do with this area? we were asking, what could we teach back here, right? And we weren't sure what those things were, you know? And so we, having these meetings with folks, um, luckily I had some people at the table who, um, friend of a friend of a friend um, showed up and, you know, we're sitting there talking about, well, there's a natural wetland back there. And I was like, well, what do we do in a wetland? Want the children get wet? Like, what, do we want to do that? And they were like, oh yes, there's a lot you can do there. And I just, you know, 
trusted Vicki Fenwick every step of the way, and she certainly guided me down the right path there. Um, but we developed the plan, as you can see, Joby Tasker, who was a former Crellin student who did landscape architect, donated his time. Um, and he helped us look at that plot and decide what would we do with it and where would we put it. And then um, parents went to the county commissioners and they asked the county to give the school that property. And they did. They gave us the property. Um, we had a plan for it. We wanted to improve it. And they said, absolutely, you can do that. Well, then came the task of how do you do all this stuff? And um, through the Bureau of Mines um, and the Office of Surface and Mining, which is a federal agency, um, and a lot of support, you know, tons and tons of support, we wrote a very large grant to be able to reclaim that area. And so when found out that when they actually pull truckloads of coal out of a mine, there's funds that go into a pot that allow you to um, use that money to reclaim an area. And so we were able to get that money to, to reclaim the area. So here's some quick pictures of it in progress. Um, I'll tell you about all those pieces in just a minute. Um, and it became this. So this is our environmental um, education laboratory behind the school. This is our amphitheater here. Um, you can see these are treatment ponds. They're lined with limestone. So that that AMD, there are pipes under all of these walkways, these paths that lead the groundwater to those areas. Um, behind here, you can't see is the wetland. There's Snowy Creek. This has changed a little bit. We have an apple orchard back here now, um, some additional gardens. Um, but this is the place where, and you can see that line of trees that used to come all the way across, that came down. We didn't want to save some of them. We didn't need to get rid of all of them. But that line of trees that had come all the way over, um, we took those down because that was sort of our going out into the, into the, the community. All right, so um, at the same time, we had our playground to contend with. So our playground looked like this. Um, it was old and rickety. Um, and we decided we found a company called Leathers and Associates at Anthica, New York that does theme-based playgrounds. And we invited them in to talk with us. And we had decided that all of the oral history projects we had done, we wanted a playground based on the, the theme would be the history of the town of Crellin. And that was very important to us. We wanted to honor all of the work um, that everyone had done. And we wanted to keep the history of the town alive. Because even though Crellin is that little tiny dot on there, um, they did have an important role in history. And so we wanted to honor that. And so um, with the help of this company and um, parents and grandparents were bringing pictures in of what it used to look like and their artifacts that they had. And our playground went from looking like that to this. And so um, this is our theme-based playground. Each piece represents a different part of the history. Um, during, this is when you, Build with this company, they send two engineers um, after it's designed, and the community has to build it. We had 638 volunteers over five days join us. There I am down here with the inmates from the Sheriff's Department. Um, they even came out, which was awesome. Um, very hard workers, I must say. And um, we built it. And the what made it work so perfect is that my parents here in this town and the community itself know how to do this. Like I, they were teaching me how to use a jigsaw. They were teaching us how to do this stuff, but they are skilled workers and could come in and make it happen. Um, and so we had grandparents cooking the food. We had all of the kids were involved in some way. The bank president said, anyone who wants to go out and help them, you can have the day off and come out and help. Um, I think there's some folks of our uh, pictures of a not sure I didn't put them all in there, but we have an Amish community nearby. They all came over to help us. Um, but we were able to, to put together an amazing, amazing playground that each piece, like I said, um, out of, after a lot of fundraising, um, represents the town. And so you can see back here is the sawmill that was here. This is the first schoolhouse. Here's the tipple. Um, you saw in the one picture, the train that was there, this represents the gun club that was in the town, the general store, 
all of those things. So, um, so we had this beautiful playground and that was happening at the same time the reclamation project was happening out back. And so we then had all of these amazing, exciting places to explore, right? So our playground is representative of the history of the town. We now have access um, to the stream it's, um, and it's pulled that back, pulled that repairing area back so that it would be um, accessible for everyone. There are ponds, nature's coming back, the wildlife is coming back, um, kids are studying, uh, you know, birds in the middle of winter, which is like eight months out of the year around here. Um, the wetland area, I learned a lot about, I've learned a lot about wetlands. <laughs> um, here they are looking at the wetlands. We had, this is us putting up their apple orchard, um, the garden club coming in, helping put in native gardens in there again. So we now have on our campus, um, you know, that five and a half acres that the county gave us, plus the acreage we already had. And we, um, uh, you know, had beautiful places to go and explore and, and learn from. And so, um, as David told you, um, we were up for an award called the Intel School of Distinction, and we're actually up for it, not in science, but in mathematics. Um, and when that happened, um, we went to a, a ceremony, and before we knew that we had won that, there was a the science, the schools that was up for science were there, and they... Um, the principal was up talking about this agriculture program they had. And we were at this big table, the staff and I are at this big table. And I look across the table and my first grade teacher, Karen Gilpin, as this one lady is talking, she's like leaning forward. She's so into what this woman is talking about this ag program. And I watching her, I thought, here we go. I know it's gonna happen. And I turned to the teacher next to me and I said, I'll bet you anything we're building a barn. And it, a couple minutes later, I remember Karen looked over at me and she said, our kids can do this. We need this. So, all right, why not? <laughs> Let's add that on. Sunshine Farm was, was um, developed. And it's called Sunshine because Sunshine is actually the original name of the town of Crelin. So Sunshine Farm came to be um, that year or the next year. We had sent, um, we sent, before we did this, we sent we sent Karen down to that school in Kansas so that she could learn what they were doing. Um, and we now have, our agriculture program has expanded. We now have two barns. Um, we have um, a greenhouse. We have hydroponics happening in the greenhouse. We have, of course, all of our gardening that's happening all starts in the greenhouse. Um, we do have a large percentage of our folks have some food insecurities throughout the year. Um, and so by having this community garden, we're really able to give back to the community um, for all that they do for us. Um, so that that's, and then the kids love, really love being a part of that. So, um, yeah, so there we are. We're, there's uh, Maya with our sheep. We have had llamas. We have had goats. Uh, we've had a calf here before. We've had, um, we have hens and you saw me with the baby lambs that are, we have sheep and our, um, they birth lambs every year. This year, Jingle and Belle were born on Christmas day, yeah, appropriately named. Um, so yeah, so now we have a big agriculture program that we get to be a part of. So in addition to all the environmental stuff behind the school, we have the agriculture um, program also happening. So I'm gonna stop for a minute because I feel like I've been rambling, but I have so much I wanna share with you. I am gonna talk about some instructional implications for all this next, but I didn't know, David, if we wanna stop and are there any questions that I need to answer right now or things you want me to address right now? Or do you want me to keep going? Uh, no, we can stop for a second. Okay. Um, Amy or Ann or Liza, anybody have a question? If not, I do have a question. Dana, one question that came up is if you could just share the name of the um, playground company again. Okay, Leathers and Associates. Okay. L-E-A-T-H-E-R-S and Associates. And they're in Ithaca, New York. And they do theme-based playgrounds all over the country. We were the first history theme based playgrounds. See, they said that usually they're like, they, people want dinosaurs or something with space and things like that. So we were the, the first theme based, um, his, his, history theme based program that they, a playground that they had made, that they helped with. 
And Sunshine Farm is so inspiring. And there's a question um, uh -huh. from Seal about how how does how do you manage the farm throughout the whole year, especially oh, over that's the coming summer? up. Count the hang oh, okay. in there, it's coming okay. up next. <laughs> and then Dana, I have a question that may also be coming up. I'm okay. interested in you having, um, I, I'm interested in you sharing some of the specific science curriculum things that are farm related. Yep, it's coming up. Okay. Yep, I just wanted to kind of give everybody an idea of where we were and what we have. Yeah. yeah. Anne or Amy, any questions? I have one. Um, Dana, this just is incredible, uh, naturally. Um, and I wondered if um, you could speak a little bit about, I got illuminated around the summertime and how those summer opportunities worked. But what about balancing the project-based learning and the PBE place-based learning um, with all of the other pieces, the ELA, the math, um, in a regular school day or week? How are, how are you managing that as an administrator? Well, hey, give me five minutes and we'll get back to that. Yeah, we're going to talk all about the instructional pieces of it coming up. Oh, good. Just curious about schedule. Yeah. Specifically, so. Good. Well, it sounds to, like to work at Krellen, I will tell you this: to, to work at Krellen, one of the first questions I ever ask is, "How flexible are you?" Right? Because there's you never know what the next opportunity could be, and you just have to be willing to go with it. Right. So you you have to be willing to do that. So flexibility is like key around here. <laughs> Okay, it sounds like- Can we continue? Got, yeah, okay. go right ahead. Okay, all right. So we're gonna talk about instruction now, the, the teaching part. So what we do is um, I kind of, in trying to help organize this, I kind of put into two different sections, right? So we have our formal lessons that are predetermined, okay? And those are very purposeful. We know they're gonna meet the standards ahead of time. They're very hands-on. Um, they're, they are authentic. We um, we don't really. There are, there are wonderful programs that you can purchase, but with what we have here, we can make it. We just immerse it in what we already have, um, because we want we want to use our place. We want we want the kids to see that learning can go beyond the the four walls in the classroom, right? And so it's important that that we keep it happening here. Um, and then we have what I call taking a back seat. And that would be the teacher taking the back seat, right? Because there are no backseat drivers. Um, these have to do with our adventures that we go on, um, where our results, the results of what you're going to end up with is not always known. Um, it's very, very kid guided. You know, they're kind of taking the lead. Um, and we're sort of standing in the background and we're facilitating things when we need to. But we're sort of just keeping our mouth quiet. Right, so it's, it's a time where you just need to kind of stand back and let happen what's gonna happen. All right. And I, I have got to make myself a note because I wrote a grant um, a year and a half ago that really focused on this part of it. And I wanna make sure I, I can tell you about that, that I save time to tell you about that. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, so some of our planned instruction. So there are things that, um, I want, we want the kids to know, right? And so we have this stream and understanding where Krellin is, where our water goes, our understanding our watershed, understanding the ecosystem within the watershed is really important, right? So we, we get every classroom, including kindergarten in the stream, um, looking for the benthic macroinvertebrates, right? They, they, they sometimes can't remember how to spell their last name, but boy, they remember the name benthic macroinvertebrate. <laughs> um, and so we, we get the kids in there. So those stream studies happen several times a year with different grades, all the grades, no matter what, that's gonna happen. That's a pre-planned one. Um, and I can very easily take that and connect it to a multitude of standards from reading um, to math, to science, to social studies, it's writing, it, it ties in beautifully. Um, there are so many resources out there um, that you can, that we've taken from, right? So we, we don't create everything our own, we take from other what we find and then we can kind of make it and twist it around and make it our own. Um, but stream study is a definite that's gonna happen. Scent stations in kindergarten, it's in the kindergarten curriculum and the science curriculum that they explore the four seasons, right? They have to understand the four seasons, they, have, they also have to know habitats, they have to know what animals are around. So scent stations, we get like four different scents from DNR, um, we have a map of the schoolyard and the kids decide what sense are we gonna put where so that we can see what animals are around 
when we're not, right? And so we clear it out. You kind of put the sand down. I'm sure you guys know how to make the, do the sun station. We look at the tracks that come. We put up cameras, trail cameras, um, and we look at what is, what is coming into our schoolyard in different areas um, at different times. And then the kids experiment. So they look at using, we tie like the research study into this. So what if we use the different scent? Do we have to stay in the same place? Well, if we move the place, then we move, you know, we talk about the corridors that they run in. They talk, so um, that is something that's gonna happen no matter what. Um, of course, all of the, the ponds and being going down and checking on what's happening in our vernal ponds, you know, are the salamanders, where are they in the stage of life? That, that's a definite gonna happen. Um, the wetland studies, that's gonna happen. That's understanding the functions of a wetland understanding the differences in the plants and what makes some plants able to survive in that wetland, right? That serves as a filter before that, that, AM, that water heads to the stream. Um, that's part of our filterization system is this natural wetland that's there. And so having the kids go through that whole process and understanding why that wetland is so important is gonna happen, right? Uh, let's see, but the gardens. The gardens are definitely something that's gonna happen. Um, I took a class math in the garden, came up with wonderful ideas. It's, I'm, I'm also the fifth grade math teacher. I, I'm a teaching principal, so I get to teach part of the day. Um, but, and I will seem to take on fifth grade math. Um, so, um, but that is an awesome, we you talk about area, you can talk about perimeter. The kids have to look at the, do research on the, decide where they're gonna, what they wanna plant, do research on it, how far do they need to be apart? How big are they gonna get? And therefore going down and measuring and deciding and putting the stakes in of where we're gonna actually plant everything. How do we get, make the most out of the space that we have? Um, all of that is tied together. And there are so many ways to tie in the writing and the, um, and the uh, reading with that. Um, in the greenhouse, uh, absolutely. Every child gets to plant in the greenhouse. Uh, the, we, one of the programs that we started this year was actually taking the gardening home. And so I, I'll talk to you about that a little bit later, but um, the greenhouse is an awesome place. Um, actually, we have with the hydroponics running, this is just a little sidebar, um, but with the sound of the hydroponics, when we had to do the state testing and a child missed it and I didn't, we're, we are very limited in space in the building. So I took him to the greenhouse and he said it was the most peaceful place to take any kind of test because of the sound of the water as, as it was filtering through and cycling through it was the greenhouse. So that's just a little sidebar. But anyway, um, the greenhouse, tons of stuff happens in the greenhouse. That's gonna happen regardless. Um, so in our agriculture program, so um, we eat the food that we grow um, in the garden. We are allowed to eat it um, and we're allowed to use the lettuce. We're allowed to use the eggs from the hens um, in the school. And so we work a lot with the extension office who come in and do a ton of different recipes with the kids. Um, so that's a big piece of it. Here is a first grade teacher is using the nesting boxes in the hen house um, and they developed a research project on it to decide which nesting box do the hens like best. And is there, are there other materials you could put in there besides the straw that they might like? And so they developed a big research project on that and built a model of it in their classroom and um, would go down and they were you know, collecting the data every day and counting the eggs. Um, here we have Mrs. Gilpin um, with the first graders or second graders. Um, we share our sheep every year and then um, we card it. The kids are carding the wool. Uh, kindergartners clean it in a plastic swimming pool with Dawn dish soap and let it dry. And then we card it. And then we have two spinning wheels and we have some folks in the community who are experts at that. And so they come in and they show the kids how to um, take that and, and weave it um, into yarn and then they create different things with it. Um, here's the extension office again, working with, um, with the kids in the garden. Um, one of the other things that we do, how we tie this in is, um, for instance, like you learn to count money and we follow Common Core. And so um, money is in second grade and therefore our second graders are responsible for after the eggs are collected. We have um, a license from the Department of Agriculture to sell the eggs. And so what they do is they're, they're charged with packaging them up and then we have our little stickers that we put in them and then they sell the eggs. And um, 
what we do then is they keep the money in their room and um, I call it financial literacy because I come to them and we have bills and I say, I need to go buy some hay bales. I need such and such amount of money. And they're so cute because they're like, no, what? we're saving money. And it's like, oh, you gotta spend money, make money. Let's go, I need that, yeah, get the hay bales. And so that's how they learn to count the money and have how to make change and all of that is they're responsible for doing that. So that becomes a large part of her, how she doesn't just teach a little unit on money. They're learning from the very beginning and, and all year long they're doing it. Um, same thing with a child in the classroom. So um, in next gen science standards, um, uh, when we adopted that, what used to be in fifth grade was very heavy in biology. Um, and so they always did our child in the classroom projects. But when we, uh, when our county state went to next gen, it at got pushed down to third grade. So our third graders now run the Troutman Classroom Program, um, which starts early in the year uh, because you have to teach the whole ecosystem and how you're, how you're gonna mimic what happens out in nature in that tank. And then we get the eggs um, from, um, our, we partner with um, Trout Unlimited and DNR and we get the eggs and then they watch those eggs and they take care of them and they watch them hatch in the tank and then uh, we're able to, because we get uh, certified to do it, we're able to put those trout that they raise in their classroom all year into the stream. When they come and do the stream stocking from uh, wildlife and fisheries, we take our trout down and put them into the stream. Um, so what we do is we create these scrolls when you're thinking about that instruction and each classroom has their own scroll, which is just a big long piece of bulletin board paper that has each month. Um, and we look at all of the different projects we have and we look at their standards and we say, okay, who's doing what? And when are you gonna do it? Like, so what's gonna be planned that we know is gonna happen? Third grade um, teaches weather. Well, you don't wanna just teach it in a three week unit because weather, you put up a weather station, my golly, you can be collecting that data all year long, right? So it, it isn't just, a unit that you do, it becomes part of how you function, but we're checking the weather and then they choose different places around the world to compare the weather in different hemispheres and just different places like that. Um, so that, that becomes part of it. In third grade, they do a lot with soil. I'm sorry, second grade. And so we have a big map of the United States and we call all everybody we know in different states and they send their soil. And so they send us some soil um, and we paint it onto this giant map. And then they look at what could be grown in different places in the United States based on the type of soil that's predominantly there, right? And that leads into a whole big study of where does our food come from and how much does it cost to get here? Um, and they're looking at the back of their little pop tart Thing and they realize where it came from and how much it costs to get it here. Um, is there something else you could eat that's better? So all of those are ways that we, we try to include all that in. So the other um, kind of way that we, we do this is by when we take in our back seat, right? And so these are the skills that um, aren't always necessarily um, in any kind of a standard, but are critical, are critical for problem solving. Right, so it shouldn't matter what the question is going to be on the test because if you've taught your kids to be critical thinkers and good problem solvers, they can figure it out. Right, they they have enough background that they can figure that out. Um, and so these um, are the student driven ones, which are allowing kids to take risks. And um, we're doing lots of observing as they are. Um, uh, they're asking us questions and we're answering their question with another question. Um, and they are building a different set of skills when we do things like this. So our adventures that we go out in, and that is just letting them go out and, and take some calculated risks, right? Um, I love this bottom picture. I stood there with them for, I don't know how long these kids stood there and trying to figure out what magic was happening that made that water move over that layer of ice every time they stepped on it. Right. And so as I began to ask them questions, they were like, is that like when you get into a bathtub and the water goes out and you get in trouble? And I'm like, yeah, kind of like that, you know, when you're stepping on that, what's happening? And, and so these are things that just sort of happen, but we do many, many 
many, many adventures. Um, tree climbing. So if you, if you want to teach your kids to think about consequences, let them climb some trees, right? So let them step on a branch one time and fall, and they're going to realize they need to think about what they're doing before they do it next time. Um, and, and we do. We let them climb. We let them explore. Um, we have some apple trees out there that they love to climb up and throw down in, into buckets that we have um, because they like to eat those. Um, but these kind of um, sort of out there and answering their and answering their questions with a question are critical important for when you're talking about you know everyone wants to talk about oh we're gonna we need to educate the whole child but then they want to zero in on a certain set of skills that they think are needed these these are the skills that are very much needed um, fort building before, hey, Dana yes we should take about five more minutes and then okay. wrap up. I'm almost done. Yep. There's lots of questions. Yep. Um, so fort building, before we teach angles, we build, go build some forts. Kids will understand about the size of angles and where things should be and um, being resourceful as they're doing this. Um, we have our sled riding hill. So our amphitheater on the other side of the amphitheater, when the parents talked about wanting something to do in the winter, we created a sled riding hill. Um, so you would be shocked at how many kids don't know how to roll down a hill, um, but they learn, right? Um, so there's a sled riding hill um, that we use during playtime and um, in gym sometimes. Uh, and then our barnyard. So um, somebody asked a question about the barnyard. So um, how we do that is this, it's embedded into what happens every day in the routine every day. And so, um, well, yes, they go out and play and they designed this whole playground for the animals because they thought that they might get the goats needed something to climb on. Um, but um, even our first graders will go down and when I'll say, we're going to bring the tractor down with the bucket on the front and you need to fill it up. We need to clean out the stalls. They will shovel and clean and, and work to get that done. Um, and it's their responsibility to feed and water the animals and to um, make sure they're being played with and love on them and um, to clean the stalls. And so we incorporate that into just the daily routine of the school. Um, free play, of course, I don't have to, that's like preaching to the choir with you guys. Everyone knows how important that, that piece is. Um, so we do have some guiding principles that we try to live by. Um, you know, that students need to learn how to care for the environment. We've all heard these before. Um, they get very intimate with the animals um, and knowing that those animals are depending on them or that, that garden is depending on them is important. It gives them, it makes them feel like they're a part of it and that what is here in this building is, is their responsibility. Um, kids need to be connected Right, they need to understand the connectedness of everything that 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 goes on. That those benthic macroinvertebrates are depending on that zooplankton, and and the, the cycle continues. Um, of course, they're gonna they're going to feel a sense of place when they and responsibility in their community when you immerse them in that community and when you make them a, a part of it, a part of solving the problems. Um, I love this picture here of them taking a goat for a ride. Um, but they love chores. So parents will say all the time, how do you get them to do that? I'm like, they love it. They love shoveling the, the waste. They don't mind doing that at all. They, they think that's big stuff. Um, and they're willing to do it, which is good. Um, you know, and we've heard this before that they need to spend time in nature and they need to love it and feel connected to it if we want them to protect it. Um, that we understand that we need to engage the community um, that's going to promote that responsibility and pride when you, you pull and you create that partnership between home and school. Um, and that we need to connect instructions to their interest and the community needs, because that's how you make them a part of it. When they are, when there is an issue in the community and our kids set to task to figure out how to be a part of that solution, then they, they look at, uh, they look at these problems in the world today and they don't just complain about it, but they jump in and they become part of making it, making it better. Um, so I wanted to tell you one, real quick about this grant that we had written. So we created a program called the Young Researchers Institute. Um, and I found this, um, it was through the Department of Agriculture, it's a federal grant. Um, and it was given to universities who do research. Um, and so in the grant application, I argued that if you want kids to grow up and be researchers, you have to allow them to be researchers 
and what's important to them first. And we wrote it based on um, some problems, four problems that the kids found in our agriculture um, program that they, they felt were problems. And I could have called any a lot, couple of different people and found out how to solve these problems, right? But I would have stolen all the learning from them. And so this is one where when I wrote this grant, I don't know what the product will be because I don't know what the kids are gonna find out. I don't know what they're gonna to wanna to do. And, but we got it, which was amazing. And so, um, and all of the money that we were getting was gonna to go to transportation in order to get the kids to the different farmers and the different universities who we partner with, who they could work with them to, as they're researching their problem, to come up with their solution, to try it out, like an action research project, right? Well, COVID hit, COVID hit, and we could not spend the money. And so I actually called, the guy at the federal level, and I was like, I'm gonna have to give it back. We can't spend this money this way. And we had about like seven, eight thousand dollars left. And he said, Listen, the federal government doesn't need your seven, eight thousand dollars. Why don't we rewrite this so that maybe the kids could be doing this while they're at home? Which was awesome because we started a home gardening program where um, the kids were, we were giving, giving out bags of soil and grow bags because a lot of our kids can't. Um, live in different kind of units where they, they don't have a yard um, so that they were able to garden at home even while we were doing it here at school, like we would be online and we could do it here. Um, and then when we were able to come back, we were still able to continue it so that we could do it in both places. So I was really thankful that they allowed us to do that. So anyway, um, this is what we want our kiddos to become. And just to show you one more of my favorite pictures ever that I'll answer more questions is this one. I absolutely love this picture because this is what happens when you take kids down and they, and you give them free time with the animals. They just want to cuddle up with them. So, I'm sorry, I could talk forever about it. I'll be quiet and let you ask, ask me some questions. That's great, Dana. It's fantastic. Couldn't have been, couldn't be a better portrait of a, a perfect school. Oh, um, we've got about five or six okay. minutes, I think, for some questions. I'm going to ask the first question, and then I'll get some other questions. <clears throat> Alicia uh, wanted to know a socioeconomic profile of the community and the parents in the school. Yeah, so we are we are a Title I school. Um, anywhere between, oh, we've been as high as 85% of our kids live out of below the poverty level. 70 maybe is our lowest number we fluctuates you know and we only have 130 kids just a couple kids can really sway those numbers so um we we receive lots of extra support through title one yeah that's yeah. great um amy do you have a question um yes i do there was a question that popped up about um students and even family or community members with physical differences, mm -hmm. um, students that might be using wheelchairs mm -hmm. or have mobility yep. issues and some of um, things that you've encountered or suggestions. You yeah, have. so when, um, when we got the grant to um, build the or do the environmental education lab. Um, all of that is ADA accessible. Even the boardwalks have a little bumps on the side. So we can take someone down there in a wheelchair. Um, going down to the stream, it's kind of layered. That's for flooding, but it's also so that you can you can take someone down. Um, yeah, we, they just come along. Um, we, we actually have a volunteer who's in a wheelchair um, and uh, who has some other disabilities, who is an active part of our school community who volunteers here all the time. And she is as much part of everything we do as, as everyone else. So you just, that's those, I mean, that's what you're teaching kids that, that it's, everybody gets to be a part of it, you know? That's great. And how about you, do you have a question? I do. Um, I wondered if um, you could talk a little bit about or any thoughts or advice that you might have um, for someone who doesn't have the kind of landscape that you might have. And it sounds to me that you've improved so much of your landscape in the time that you've been there, the teachers and you have. Right. Um, so just in terms of that and maybe workshops you've done for other schools that don't have. Yeah. Yeah. So we have some, um, I have some colleagues that live, um, work more in an urban area. 
um, when you can still find lots of nature around. If you, um, we, we talked about uh, the bird houses that we can do. You talked about the, the gardening that you can still do and, and you use different, you may not be doing it in the ground, but you can certainly make salad tables. So, which is just, I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's a table that has chicken wire screen across the top that allows you to, you just put a bag of soil in there and cut the top off and you can plant lettuce in there and you can plant radishes and onions and all kinds of things in there. Um, and so that, that's, that would be my take on it. That's what I would do. There's definitely ways you can include it. Um, trout in the classroom happens in schools across the nation in all different areas. Um, it's a wonderful program. Um, so yeah, so there, there are definitely ways you can still tie it in. It's, it's how, how much outside of the norm where you are, are you willing to go, right? So when you're in a school and there are certain norms already in place and you wanna to try to do something different, um, you have to be willing to step outside that. And it can be a little uncomfortable at times, but um, it's well worth it, well worth it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Eliza, how about you? Maybe we'll have one more question. Yeah, I feel like this just kind of um, piggybacks on what you were starting to talk about, Dana, the question around if you're not an administrator and you're not a teacher in a, in a school, how as a community member might you get involved to make something like this happen or at least begin the process? Yeah, so um, you, there are, in every school, there are some informal leaders Right? So they're not always the loudest one in the school, but they are definitely the ones who have um, credibility and they have, I don't want to say power, but they do have, they are respected, well respected. Um, and so joining forces with people like that, who um, are willing to take a risk and do something different. I think that um, I always, whenever I talk about this with teachers and, and they'll say, well, what if my administrator doesn't want me to or won't let me? And I'll say, well, you need a plan, right? So your administrator is under some pressure too. So you need a plan and you need a plan that um, one is always going to make them look good, right? Happy parents are happy administrators. Um, and so uh, you, you, you have that plan and you have a plan of how you're going to, how you're going to do it instead of. So teachers, will look at it and go, oh my golly, I cannot add another thing to my plate. But you need to look at it from the lens that you're not adding anything to your plate. Instead of doing it the way you've been doing it, you're gonna do it a different way. So you're gonna teach those same skills as everybody else's and the same standards as everybody else. You're just gonna come at it from a different way. Um, and I, I think when you can help people see that and that they kind of relaxes their shoulders that, oh my golly, okay, so it's not one more thing to add to my to-do list. Nope, because you're not doing that anymore. Instead, you're doing this. Um, I think that that is helpful. And also, like if you're a community member, bringing, helping teachers find the resources for it. That can off, often be, if they're not the administrator who is going to make all those phone calls, helping them find the resources that, that, can, that can push it forward, because that's usually the time. And offering to, to take the time to make those connections for and with the teacher, because time is the enemy. Like if you ask any educator, they're gonna say, it's time, it's time, there's not enough time. And so as a community member coming in saying, let me take this off your plate, I'm gonna help you do this, um, would probably go quite far, I don't think. I would like it. <laughs> That's great. I appreciate it, all your, your wisdom, Dana, you've done it for so long and you do it so well, it's really inspiring for all of us. Danny, so you should. I have my my emails there, and that first number is my cell number. Oh, good. Um, so uh, you all can have that, and then the bottom number is my school number. So okay. feel free to email, or if you have any other questions that didn't get answered or whatever, feel free. And anything I have that you might need, if you want to try something, I'm we willing to share it with you. Yay! So Danny, you should stop your okay. sharing yeah. your screen.